strong enough to bear the burdens that sometimes come living this thing called life am i wise enough to make the right decisions when i'm standing at the fork in the road sometimes i wonder and ponder only to realize i'm not alone and there's nothing i have to do on my own because i am the place where god lives moves and breathes and has its being i am the place where god shows up i am the place where god lives moves and breathes and has its being i am the place where god shows up will i have enough to do the things i need to do to take care of myself will i have the health of mind and body to live a life of grace and wholeness sometimes i wonder and ponder only to realize i'm not alone and there's nothing i have to do on my own because i am the place where god lives moves and breathes and has its being i am the place where god shows up i am the place where god lives moves and breathes and has its being i am the place where god shows up i am the place you are the place we are the place where God shows up, I am the place, you are the place, we are the place, where God shows up, now I want you to clap your hands and sing it with me, and saying, I am the place where God lives, moves and breathes and has its being, I am the place where God shows up, now if you got a mirror next to you, look at the mirror and say, you are the place where God lives, moves and breathes and has its being. You are the place where God shows up. I am the place where God lives, moves and breathes and has its being. I am the place where God shows up. I am the place where God lives, moves and breathes and has I am the place where God shows in a way, an odd thing to honor those who died in defense of our country, in defense of us, in wars far away. The imagination plays a trick. We see these soldiers in our mind as 
old and wise. We see them as something like the founding fathers, grave and gray-haired. But most of them were boys when they died, and they gave up two lives, the one they were living and the one they would have lived. When they died, they gave up their chance to be husbands and fathers and grandfathers. They gave up their chance to be revered old men. They gave up everything for our country, for us. We owe them a debt we can never repay. All we can do is remember them, what they did, and why they had to be brave for us. Good morning, CSL Palm Desert and everyone beyond here. We're so very glad you're joining us this morning. Our guest artist today travels the world and he's fantastic. Uh, in fact, I think he and uh, Reverend Charles did a show recently online at one of our 10 o'clock services. Uh, it's Jamie Lula, everybody. So let's welcome Jamie Lula. Good morning, Palm Desert Center for Spiritual Living. I'm so grateful to be with you today and with my brother Charles. I wish you all the best as we move through this and I look forward to joining you someday soon. Stay strong, peace and blessings. I hope you're grateful that you are alive. Woo! This is a Floyd Lula song. Sunshine Your eyes do drops, dragonflies. I'm so grateful I'm alive. 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 I'm so grateful I'm alive.
I'm alive. I'm so grateful I'm alive. Sing it out, sing it out. I'm so grateful I'm alive. I'm so grateful I'm alive. I'm so grateful I'm alive. happening this week at the center. This one book began the journey for Reverend Charles. The book, This Thing Called You by Ernest Holmes. Join Reverend Charles as he continues to share his wisdom and discuss further the importance of this text. They're back, Dr. Joe and Reverend Charles diving deep and sharing transformational principles while inviting you to participate in the question and answer interactive format. We're entering into a new era and it's time to be spiritually prepared. On Wednesday, the Sensational Six Ministerial students continue discussing and explaining the spiritual laws and how you can apply them in your daily life. Make sure to mark your calendars. On Thursday, join Dr. Joe, Melanie Taylor, and Terry Wallman as they share their journeys in a concert and conversation session. From Bette Midler to Aerosmith, from Melissa Manchester to Michael McDonald, and so many more, you will not want to miss this once-in-a-lifetime interview. On Friday, it's makeup class. Reverend Charles completes his course he began two weeks ago with Resistance to Resiliency and This Thing Called You. And on Saturday, join us for another new meditation waiting for you at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you interacting and growing together. It all happens every day at 10 a.m. on the CSL Palm Desert website. Make sure to mark your calendars today. Hey, so every week we start out with our mission statement and we start out with our mission statement because we feel it's necessary to continue to remind you and all of us why we're doing what we're doing. So please join me. Our mission, we are a dynamic, open, and positive faith community that accepts all religions. Our mission is to awaken you to your divine nature, empowering you to create the life of your dreams. We are changing lives one heart at a time. So now it's time for us to move into that part of the service where we have quiet time. It's a time for us to hit pause on what's going on in our life, a time for us to not search for answers or ride the question mark that what's happening in the world, but rather to get to that quiet space within. So please join me as you take a deep breath in, hold it for a couple seconds, then exhale out. One more deep breath in and hold for a couple seconds. And exhale out. And so we walk into this beautiful field of possibilities in this moment. Imagine, if you will, that there is just a field before you with flowers and the wind is gently blowing. And there's a future out there beyond the steps that you're taking in this moment. And that future is just beautiful and it's surrounded by warmth and light and texture and color. And it's inviting you to walk in its field of glory and to know that you are divinely guided, sustained, and maintained by that infinite presence as you walk through and into your good. Know that you are always surrounded by that infinite intelligence of God, that one mind, that one heart, and that one love. And so as we move through this experience today, we allow ourselves to become open and receptive to a new idea, an awakened idea, an idea that will move us forward into that field of beauty, knowing that we too are that expression of God. We are that wonder and that color. We are its wave. We are its movement. And so with grace and ease, we move into our quiet time now where we spend a few moments in silence just knowing, knowing that we don't have to find an answer, we don't have to find a timeline, we don't need to do anything right now other than to be in this moment 
and just be receptive and open to our breath, to the very heart that is beating our heart, to our connection to the energy of love, and to the source of all good in life. So take a deep breath in. And as you exhale, let's just spend a few moments in that peace. Still my mind Be at peace In my awakening I release With my heart With my heart Free my soul in my awakening, in my awakening, I am whole, I am whole. as I love, as I love, and as I give, as I give, in my awakening, in my awakening, I choose to live. Give me strength. Give me strength. Shine your light. Shine your light. In my awakening. In my awakening. Clear my sight. Clear my sight. All I believe. All I believe. And all I know. In my awakening, I let go, fill me with love, and conquer my fears, in my awakening, God appears. Still my mind, still my mind, be at peace, be at peace, in my awakening, in my awakening, I release, I release. Om Shanti Om, Shanti Om, Shanti Om. Shanti Om, Shanti Om, Shanti Om. Om Shanti Om, Shanti Om, Shanti Om, Shanti Om, Shanti Om, Shanti Om. Shanti Om, Shanti Om, Shanti Om, Shanti Om, Shanti It's with a renewed sense of strength, of confidence, of spiritual authority that we take a breath into this moment. We release that which needs to be released, accepting the beauty of what is in this day. For this we're so very grateful. We let it be so, and so it is. Amen. Show me the way Show me the way Your love will light 
my way. Show me the way. Show me the way. Show me the way. Your joy. Show me the way. Show me the way. Show me the way. Show me the way. Your peace. Your peace will light. Will light my way. My way. Show me the way. Show me the way. Show me the way. Your truth, your truth will light, will light my way. My way. And your love, your love will light, will light my way. My way. And your joy, your joy will light.
passion, faith and hope and love and truth will set us free. Oh, Father, Father God, there's a healing going on. Father, Father God, there's a healing going on. Once again, Palm Desert Center for Spiritual Living, thank you, bless you for having me. I know only the best is being revealed for your community as it unfolds. Love to Joe Hooper and his family and uh, the whole Palm Desert Center for Spiritual Living community. Peace and blessings. See you real soon. So. As we progress through this time of shelter in and we begin to open things up slowly and as we begin the process of opening up to this new whatever this is going to be, uh, I was reflecting on how I've been looking at the situation and people and my response to, the, to people. And so what I decided to do is I want to go back and I want us to review the four agreements. And the reason why is because we have a new opportunity as we move into this new whatever this is that we're moving into. We have an opportunity to put some principles into play. Some principles into action that will allow us to create a better world after all of this is all done. But we need to remind ourselves of the foundation and how to do that. The principles of how to do that. Don Miguel Ruiz wrote that book, The Four Agreements, a long time ago. And, and I've been teaching it several times at the center. I think I've done a couple talks on it. But I want to spend the next few weeks, literally the next few weeks, walking us through the most important chapters. Now today there's going to be a lot of PowerPoints. There's a lot of facts that I want, facts and things I want to put in place before we begin principle number one today, which will be uh, being impeccable with our word. But I wanted to lay this groundwork out because I think it's necessary for us to do do so. So here we go. Join me on the journey. It's called the dream of the planet. The dream of the planet is the collective dream of billions or smaller personal dreams which together create a dream of a family, a dream of community, a dream of a city, a dream of a country, and finally a dream of the whole humanity. It's interesting that he talks about the dream of the planet and literally this effect that has happened over the past few months has affected every single component of that statement. Everybody has been affected by this. So there is now a collective dream of not only returning to health but seeing what is beyond the health. Now, how do we create a dream when we have a past that has sort of plagued us or, or guided us or at times motivated us uh, to do different things? We are hooked as children to dream or to pay our attention with the rules of our parents, what our parents created, our schools forced upon us, and religious perspectives more than likely scared us into fears about God and hell. So early on, 
Let's, so, let's go back and establish this. So early on, if we want to have a dream of a planet, it has to fit within the confines of that which we've been taught we can achieve. And who taught us that but our parents and our teachers and maybe a church leader? They taught us those things and, and we learned right from wrong, good from bad. And I'm going to talk about that because we've created for ourselves a book that we've been playing out up till now. We have been playing out the book that we have been given or gifted, and maybe we've made a few re revisions here and there, but I want us to really concentrate on what the new book is going to look like. Moving on, as children, we didn't have the opportunity to choose our beliefs, but we agreed with the information that was passed to us from the dream of the planet from other people. So, you know, when we were a kid, we just took it, you know, we, we, we absorbed what was going on in the world, and we just said, okay, that's what's going on. We never questioned it. We never really thought we would have, like, we call it the spiritual authority to question those things. So as a kid, we were programmed early on. We were told certain things. We were told that this is what a dream, this is what the American dream looks like. This is what this dream of success looks like. This is what, you know, and if you don't have those things, you're considered a failure. Sound familiar? So we were attached to this idea of a dream that other people helped create for us. Now as we got older and older, we began to modify that, but the basis of it started there. The belief system is like a book of law. So we create a book of law. They're the rules of our mind and our dreams. One by one, all of these agreements go into our personal book of law. So one by one, you have created a book of law. What you believe is right, what you believe is wrong, what you believe is success, what you believe is failure, what you believe in faith, what you believe in fear. You've created a book of law that is defining all of your activity. And anything and everything that happens goes through this book of law and is interpreted by you through the book that you've written. Now some of us, like I said, some of our books were written early on. Parts of the books may still be intact that you were taught early on. There may be other fear factors that may be there that you're not aware aware of, but they're part of it too because you always have waiting for the next shoe to drop or waiting for some negative thing to happen because it can't all be good because that's what we were taught. So even though you've revised some of the book, still some of those things may be in place. Now, wherever there's a book of law, there has to be a judge. <laughs> Plain and simple. If you, have to ha if you have a book of law, then someone has to be able to enforce it. The inner judge creates a victim who is not meeting expectations based on the book of law each individual has created. Ironically, the book of law makes us feel safe. The judge decrees and the victim suffers the guilt and excuse me, the guilt and punishment. So let me unpack that for just a second. There's an inner judge. And that inner judge creates a victim when you're not meeting the expectation. So you have a book of law of what you say, think is success. If I don't meet that success, then I become a victim of my own book. In other words, I become a victim of the book of law that I've created. So now I have to be punished because I didn't do that. Now sometimes the book makes us feel really safe. Sometimes that book and the judge makes us feel really guilty and that we should punish ourselves. So imagine what book you've written for yourself. I bet if I sat down with you and I said, look, tell me about your life that we would actually be able to create the book that you've been following your whole life. True justice is paying only once for each mistake. Now again, I'm setting the foundation for us to move into the four agreements. So I want us to understand this. True justice is paying only only once for each mistake. True injustice is paying more than once for each mistake. And that's what we do. Why? Because if we have a failure, we don't just have one failure. We remind ourselves of the failure that we had for decades. We share the story of our failures with everyone. And so it, we're punished constantly by the same story. And usually there's someone in our life who will remind us where we've fallen short. There's someone who's going to tell you how you didn't meet the expectation. And that's an injustice. Think about it. You know, if you make a mistake, you should only pay for it once. But no, no. If you're married, you know if you make a mistake, you never pay for something once. You pay for it multiple times because every argument, it's coming up. It's coming up. They, they dig it back up all over you, right? So... <clears throat> True injustice is when that happens. True justice is like, I made a mistake, I'm sorry. Okay, let's move on, what's for dinner? All right? Every time we remember what happened, we go through a mental process of punishing ourselves. And we do. <laughs> 
And that punishment that we remind ourselves, uh, when we remind ourselves about a certain situation that we, that we violated the book of law and now we're a victim, and when we, we remember that and we, we recall it, we're constantly drinking in emotional poison and we're, trying, and we're reliving our mistake. I mean, how many times can you beat yourself to death over something? I know people <clears throat> who've had things happen in their lives, and I would say a business failed years ago, and I do mean years ago, but daily they continue to relive it, and the reason why they've never succeeded at anything else is because they're still living in something that happened 20, 25 years ago. They never got past it. They never got past the guilt or the shame, and they, they never rewrote the book of law. Once a failure, always a failure. Boom. Accepted. Ironically, the book of law that we have created may have been based on false or misinformation. But because we created our books of law based on those beliefs, we may be have judging ourselves based on a lie. Okay. So wait a minute. The book of law was given to me over time by people early on in my life, and I accepted that, and I may have challenged some of them, but in the, in the background, there's basically a foundation of this book, right? And so some of those things may have been true about me, but maybe those weren't. But I continue to believe it. So many of the things that you have in your book of your law that you've created are no longer applicable. Those would be considered a lie. The lie we live in becomes our own version of hell. That's why sometimes we spend so much time there, is because our book of law is telling us that's what we've done wrong, and now we have to pay the price. Your mind is a dream where a thousand people talk at the same time and nobody understands each other. <laughs> you thought you were alone. No, that's what we do. <laughs> our minds are constantly listening to these voices. And whichever voice seems to be the loudest, that's the one we ultimately listen to, but because all the voices are talking to us, it's almost impossible to establish who, we're, who we really want to be. And I know this feeling, I know you do, because it's like, well, I want to do this and I want to do this. No, you can't do that. I mean, I have, uh, I, I, Sybil had how many personalities? I think I've got like a thousand people in my head all the time. And they're all in great debate. And some of them make perfect sense and some don't make sense at all, but I still follow their dialogue in my head. I still listen to them. And the, so I go through the process of, of having to define and redefine, define and redefine and, and drill my way into what I want my new book of law to look like because of all these voices in my head. The biggest thing we have to fear, death is not the biggest thing we have, the biggest fear we have. Our biggest fear is taking the risk to be alive and to risk being alive by expressing who we really are. Death isn't our biggest fear. Death isn't our biggest fear. Our biggest fear is to live an authentic self. Will I be accepted if I live authentically? Will I be accepted if I take the risk and start expressing myself as the way I would like to? That's the biggest fear. Because our book of law, a lot of books of law, not, maybe, not all, but most, they say, don't show people that thing. Don't, peop, don't show that people that side of you. They may not like it. Well, what happens if I'm not liked? Oh, that I can't share it because I won't be liked. So I take my dream and I take my authenticity and I stuff it down because I'm afraid I won't be liked if the true self begins to take the risk and become its true self in all facets. We think we can be perfect. Not being perfect, we reject ourselves. So I know that people think there, there is a level of perfectionism and if we can't be perfect, we reject the idea. I know people that won't embark upon journeys in business and relationships because they think they have to be perfect in them. And so because they're perfect, they think they have to be perfect and they're not perfect, they reject the, themselves and the idea of even making it a possibility in their lives. That is a book, that is part of a book of law that is just crap. We need to get rid of this idea. It's not working for us. We have to know that we're going to have imperfections. My God, if I had a list of all my imperfections, people would just like, well, oh, of course I compare myself with anyone else. We all have them. We have, we have a book of law and oh my God, a book of imperfections. Look, you don't have to be perfect. Stop rejecting yourself because everything's not exactly perfect. The old book of law that said you have to do things perfectly, that's a lie. You have to risk your life, you have to risk and put yourself out there in the world in order to be alive. You have to risk being yourself and being authentic in order to be alive. Otherwise, you're following a book that is dead. It's old and it's misunderstood with bad information. 
Once we're rejected, we attract people who reject us, sometimes abuse us. Oh, this, in, in his book, this chapter is really, it, it hurts. It hurts. Listen to this. Once we are rejected, we attract people who reject us and sometimes abuse us. Then we don't forgive ourselves for not being perfect and begin the process of feeling even more rejected. So now, here I am rejected. I'm attracting people who are rejecting me or even abusing me. And because I don't forgive myself, I begin the process of feeling even more rejected. So what am I doing? I'm just pushing myself down further and further until I almost disappear from the picture. The self disappears. The self disappears. All of this is based on the agreements we have made based on our book of law. So all of these agreements of success and of failure and, of, and, and the law of attraction bringing people into our lives that, that treat us nicely and people that don't treat us nicely. All of this has been based on the book of law that we've created for our lives. And now I'm saying this. Maybe it's time to change our agreements around the book, our book of law and rewrite parts of our book. Maybe it's time for us to look at that, especially as we enter into whatever this next phase is, as we enter into the next phase of, of humanity post this virus. Maybe we need to start looking at this, and I want to try to create for you and for me a world that's working for people and working for everyone. In order to do that, maybe we need to change our book a little bit and align ourselves with some key principles that will keep us in integrity when it comes to treating one another with respect and love. So that's my goal by teaching this, is to teach us as, an individ as individually to learn certain skill sets, to be aware of certain things, so that collectively, if we get this message out to enough people, we'll begin to change the way the energy moves around communication, the way the energy moves around relationships. That's essential at this point because everything is up in the air. A lot of people have had this spiritual awakening. Now where do we go from here? Can we, do we go back to our bad habits of, of communicating and divisive nature? Or do we try to move into a different direction? That's why I feel it's really important to teach these four agreements at this time so that we can move in with a greater sense of self, a greater sense of how we fit into the bigger picture, and with a new book of a buckle of law that we've created for ourselves that no longer has all of the old paradigms that we've been actually judging ourselves against for years. The first agreement is this, being impeccable with your word. Number one agreement. Why is that first? Because all you really have is your word. That's your law. Your word creates it all. The way I can express myself to anyone and everyone is by words. It's by my word. And so if I'm not impeccable with my word, then I can't be believed. People won't believe in me. If I'm not impeccable with my word, people will try to see through certain things or they'll be, it'll be divisive. People won't trust you. You have to be impeccable with your word because your word is all you have. Once someone doesn't trust you, they don't believe what you're saying, you're probably not being impeccable with your word. The word is not just a sound or written symbol. Your word is a force. So let's talk about that. Words are a force. A force to be reckoned with. And they're a double-edged sword. <laughs> they're a double-edged sword. Words help and they heal. And they hurt and they create divisiveness. It's a double-edged sword. Your word can help bring people up or tear them down. How you use your word is, is a, a, a reflection of not just you, but the book that you believe in, the book of law that you're creating, and are you being consistent with what you say you want to be and that which is coming out of your mouth. So, the words, to free or enslave, to create heaven or create hell, to build or destroy, to complement or condemn. That's what our words do. That's the double-edged sword around that part. We can free or we can enslave people with our words. We can create heaven or we can create hell with our words. We can build people up or we can knock them down. We can compliment people or we can condemn people. That word is very powerful. Our word is very powerful. The human mind is like fertile ground. Like any type of soil, certain things grow best in certain soil in certain environments. So in our words, our, the humankind is very fertile ground. This up here, man, I tell you what, it's unlike any other soil. It grows best in certain environments and we, go bat, we grow best when we're being supported and loved, not criticized and condemned. We, get, we grow the most when we feel confident and we can trust others and others can trust us. 
So when the human mind, the human mind, which uh, the body-mind connection and everything runs through the human mind, when we have that relationship, when we begin to have that relationship with our word, the human mind begins to become a fertile ground for all sorts of growth. Now that doesn't mean other people are going to be in agreement with you in doing this, but it's important how I act in my life. It's important that I act with integrity, that I communicate with integrity the people who are important to me, how I communicate with them. Here's the thing, don't project your words on me. I find that to be really offensive. I find that to be really challenging. In fact, now more than ever, I'm watching all these people around me fight for different things, right? Oh, this, whole, this whole COVID thing. I'm, I'm watching all of this, you know, this side and that side and this side and that side and everybody. And it's like, wow, just don't, you know what? I'm going to make up my own mind. Don't try to project your words on me. Let me be, let me be the arbiter of my own experience. Let me be the creator of my own experience, the interpreter of my own experience. I don't need anybody banging me on the head one way or another in any given direction. I need to be able to sift through things on my own, put it through my spiritual filter, and come up with my own solutions. Not those people that are trying to bang any kind of an idea into my head. You don't, you don't get anywhere by trying to bang an idea into people's heads. You have to be loving and, ne and negotiate and talk and communicate. That's not going to be effective. Pounding things down in, in, in any way, shape, or form on either side of any equation is never going to move anything forward. It's just going to create an idea and have more conflict. Conflict creates conflict. Chaos creates more chaos. Peace creates peace. Come to me in a peace agreement. We can make that happen. Come to me in chaos and, and, and anger. We're probably going to have more of it before we leave the table. Somebody has to come in there with a new idea. What are some passwords that others have used that, have, that you have accepted as your truth? You have to ask yourself, other people have used their words, come from their book of law, and you may have accepted what they said as your truth. I've given this story before and I want to share it again, and I know you guys are probably bored of hearing it, but for some of you this is new. I had a speech teacher in high school tell me that I should never speak in public, that I didn't have what it takes to speak in public. And, you know, when I was in, in high school, I thought, wow, I guess I should really never speak in public because someone who knows something or someone who I think knows something more than I do is telling me that I should never do that. And for many years, I didn't. For many years, I would never take up front and go up to, do, to talk in front of people because I thought, no, you can't. You don't have the skill set. You don't have the, the composure. You don't have um, the, the energy to do that. And it wasn't until one day when someone told me something different many years later that I finally changed my mind and went, wait a minute, I, why was I accepting her, what she told me uh, and that became my truth? No. You don't diminish people by doing that. I accepted that as my truth. And, and for many years, I, I didn't do what I should be doing, I should have done, because someone told me that I couldn't do it or that I wasn't going to be good at it. And come to find out, that's not the case. But I had, to, I had to test it. I had to risk it. I had to go out beyond that book and push it. And I had people like, like around the center who encouraged me to do that, who mentored me and who encouraged me and who said, no, this is a great possibility for you, Joe. Do this. Try this. And it wasn't until that moment I was able to let go of that lie and step into a new truth. What lie do you need to let go of? Who told you that you can't have a good loving relationship? And why did you buy it? Who told you you can't be healthy? And why did you buy it? Who told you you can't have fi financial security and make money doing what you love? Who told you that? And why did you buy it? Why did it become part of your, your book of law? How their words affected you, it's written in your life. And you're helping write other people's book of law the way you speak to them. It's the same premise. The word impeccability, impeccable, uh, pedicus means sin, the, uh, the I am on that means without. So im at the beginning, and, and impeccatus means without sin, means without error, without accu accusation. Now sin is a word just meaning missing the mark. So it's without missing the mark. It's without error that we, we are impeccable with our words. We try our very best. And who is anybody perfect at it? I've never met anybody. I don't think, no, I've never met anybody. I've never met anybody. 
maybe one in my entire life. I'm 57 years old, but even then I saw them lose their cool. So no, that wouldn't work either. So I've never met anybody who is 100% in charge of being impeccable with their word. Everyone has a tendency to kind of not be at times, but the goal is to do as best as we can and do better than we did the day before. There's where we move in the direction. There's where we move in the direction. Sin, everything you feel, say or, or is, goes into, wait a minute, back up. Everything you feel, believe, or say that goes against yourself is a sin. If it doesn't help lift me up, then it's an error. Sin is a word that biblically people have just thrown around to create a sense of fear. I'm surprised he even has it in his book, really. But he has the word, right? And the word, everything you feel, believe, or say, that goes against yourself. So when, it, it, you know how it's, it's, I would be say this, it's a sin, it's an error for me to believe a lie, right? Turn it 180. When I am impeccable, I take responsibility for my actions. I do not blame or judge myself. I just take responsibility for it. I don't need to judge it. I'm the one who did it. As long as I'm apologetic, as long as I'm responsible for my actions, good, bad, or indifferent, I am responsible. I, I don't need to judge myself. I just need to be impeccable with my word and be responsible for my actions. That's what I don't like. That's the one thing I'm seeing that I just drives me crazy. Just be responsible for your actions. Everyone. You know? If, if this, and I'll say it. I'll say it. Oh my God, I'm going to go there. This, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Mar wear a mask, don't mar wear a mask. You know what? It's just, just be responsible for your actions. That's all. Just be responsible. You know, I know what I do. I know what I wear, right? I know that I, I wear one. But you're just as responsible as I. Just be responsible. Take control and just say, look, I'm being responsible with my life. And I'll make my appropriate reaction to your action. That's the difference. I have a choice. I have a choice. Next thing. Words are magic and they cast spells. Now he talks about casting spells. Words are. Words are very magic. We, well, my words can project my life into amazing places. Right? And I, it's like casting a spell because they're very powerful. Just like bewitched, man. It's like, okay, once I cast this spell, things are going to happen. Once I put my word out there, things will happen in a certain way. That's why he says words are magic and they cast spells. Now, when we hear an opinion and believe it, we make an agreement and it becomes part of our belief system. So remember this. When we hear an opinion and we believe it and we make an agreement with it, it becomes part of our belief system, which is now our book of law. So what I hope is happening during this time of shelter and during this time of this, this spiritual awakening, which occurred out throughout the world, literally throughout the world, um, if people took advantage of that, is a chance for us to rewrite our book of law. To, be, to literally look at our belief systems, look at the opinions that we've been listening to, um, agree, making agreements with certain things in our life that will continue. In my mind, that's the most, one of the most essential components is what am I agreeing to keep with me after all of this? And whatever that is becomes my new book of law. It's time to change some of the rules. It's time to look at my priorities and where am I putting my attention and my intention to make sure that they're consistent with what I realize were priorities that I may have been too busy to follow because I was busy doing life instead of living my life. Gossip. When you talk about being impeccable with your word, gossip is like a computer virus. It will shut everything down. It is written in the same language with a harm with harm as the intent. There is no place, if you're being impeccable with your word, to gossip. You just don't. We talk about that all the time in my classes. We talked about right methods of communication. You know what? If you wouldn't say it in front of the person, don't say it at all. But if you would say it in front of the person, you're like, look, if, I, if that person were standing right here, I would say this out loud, then okay, do what you have to do. Remember your word can help or it can harm. And how is that going to be, how is that going to make you feel better if the words that you use are going to harm someone else? Talking people behind their back. How is that going to help you use your words to lift people up? Come on. 
Our responsibility is to try to move this in the right direction. We have a new chance, a new opportunity to move things in a different direction. Are you taking that opportunity? Are you taking that chance? Stop the gossip behind the scenes. If you have something that you would like to discuss with someone, approach them directly. Don't go behind their back. No one, no one likes to have people talking behind their back. No one. Opinions. Here we go. He talks about opinions. We imprint an idea based on an opinion we've heard. It creates an emotional code. But we're never really sure why someone has that opinion, but we code it anyway. So let's unpack this. We imprint an idea based on an opinion we've heard, and it creates an emotional code. Something we hear, we create an opinion around it, then some of us become very passionate around it. It's an emotional code. It's a trigger for good things and trigger for bad things. So would we imprint an idea and we've accepted that idea and that opinion that we've heard, now we give it an emotion. We say it's good, it's bad, it's, it's exciting, it's horrible, whatever it is. But we're never really sure why other people have their opinions, but we code their opinions anyway. We don't know where people came from. We don't know their life experience. We don't know their book of law. We don't know the things that, that have transpired in their life. We don't know their whole life story. You may have glimpses into someone's life, but you really don't know their whole life story. You don't know what goes on in people's heads. You don't even know what goes on in your spouse's or your family's heads. Half the time, we're just guessing about what we think people are thinking about. And we're drawing our opinions on what we're thinking they think about. And there's an emotional code around that. There's, a, there's an emotional coding process that happens. And that emotional coding process is triggered by when we see something or that looks or smells or, or tastes like something, it brings on that emotional trigger. And next thing you know, we're on the other end of, of some sort of a disagreement with someone based on this coding process. Not what's really happening in real life, not what's happening in the moment. It's happening because we've coded, we've, we've coded their behavior. We've set an emotion to it and it triggers us. When you're impeccable with your word, you don't make those kind of assumptions with people. You don't look at people and, and know where their emotional code came from. You just have to take it and, and accept it and talk about things. Communicate so you understand where people come from. Next thing, page 43. If we adopt the first agreement and become impeccable with our word, any emotional poison will eventually be cleaned from our mind and from our communication and our personal relationships including with our pets, cats, and dogs. I like the way you put that in there. Impeccability of the word will also give you immunity from anyone putting a negative spell on you. You will only receive a negative idea if your mind is fertile ground for that idea. When you become impeccable with your word, your mind is no longer fertile ground for words that come from that black magic, that, that, that stuff that's um, destructive. Instead, it is fertile for the words that come from love. You can measure the impeccability of your word by, the, by your level of self-love. How much you love yourself and how much you feel about yourself are directly proportionate to the quality and integrity of your word. When you are impeccable with your word, you feel good, you feel happy, and at peace. So being impeccable with our word will ultimately bring us a sense of peace. Something that may have been lacking. Something that may have been not as great as you want to experience. Affirm, I am impeccable with my word. Take that exercise this week. I'm impeccable with my word. My, before it comes out, is this going to help or harm someone? Is it going to build or destroy? Is it going to create or is it going to demolish? Think about those things. Create this, create, let's create this foundation for whatever this new thing is that, sits, that stands ready for us to move into it whenever we're supposed to move into it. But I want you to be prepared and I want myself to be prepared to have that integrity around that idea I believe if we get there, when we get there, as we get there, collectively, one by one by one, to whoever's listening to this, pick up this book, start reading it, take these lessons to heart, and let's try that this week. Be impeccable with your word. And so ends your lesson. Thank you.
So we hope you enjoyed today's lesson. We hope you enjoyed our music today. And now it's time for us to look into ourselves and begin to see how we can support this work that we've been doing here at the Center for Spiritual Living Palm Desert. Um, I've been saying on several of the broadcasts, I know that when people are ready to come back to our center and to come back into this sacred space, they want it to be like it was when they left. They want the music department to be intact. They want the, the building to be well maintained and they want the staff to be here to help assist them and they want everything to be the same. And I, that's what I want for us. Not to be the same, I want us to actually be better. And I want to see more people in because they've, they've found out who we are, they found out where we are, and they want to try coming to the center. In order to do that, it relies on your support. It relies purely on your support. And so we don't have any big benefactors. We don't have people who write big checks. We have several people who write smaller givings and offerings, and we are so very grateful, and I do mean this from the bottom of my heart, from this entire time, we are so very grateful for literally every penny that has come into our center. And now I would like for all of you to look deep into your heart and see how this has touched you today and how this message and how the messages we put out there every single day, every seven days a week at 10 o'clock, how those messages and those YouTubes that you've been able to go back and look at, how they've impacted your experience over this time and how it's impacting what is going forward in your new experience. Whatever you give great thanks for, it grows. And so I hope you're grateful for our center today and I hope you're able to offer whatever you can to our center. And if you have the ability to, to double it or triple it to, because other people can't and you can actually you know, help sustain and maintain and continue to allow our center to thrive, we greatly appreciate it. So hold your love offering or, or the idea of it in your hand and just know this. Know that we are so very grateful for all that comes into our center and we're so very grateful for this opportunity that we've had to share this time with you today. I recognize and know that each one of us is guidedly sustained and maintained and directed by that infinite presence as the Center for Spiritual Living Palm Desert continues to do its great work in our community and now far beyond for those people who are joining us from far and wide. We give great thanks for all of that support and we give great thanks for the love that you've shared with us and that we are reflecting right back to you in every way, shape, or form. We're so very grateful you're here. We're so very grateful you were part of this. Something wonderful is happening and you have been a part of it. And we, together we say, and so it is. Amen. So thank you so much for coming to and joining us this week. Don't forget, at 10 o'clock every morning, we have something special to offer you. If you haven't done so, get onto our website. Make sure you're, you're linked in. And get on, uh, if you need to get onto the uh, email blast, we'll take care of that. And don't forget, you can always go to the YouTube channel and, and or subscribe, not inscribe, subscribe to the Center for Spiritual Living Palm Desert. And every time we upload something onto YouTube, get your notification. And please, by all means, take advantage of this time to continue to expand your spiritual awareness. We're so very grateful that you joined us today. Thank you very much.